Okay, welcome to the Pearson Center's webinar series, which began in April of last year, and we expected to carry on for a while as we were able to address a number of important issues uh, that face us as, as a country with a number of fascinating experts, as we will now. Today, we will talk about politics on Parliament Hill in the House and in the Senate. My name is Andrew Cardozo, and I'm president of, of the Pearson Center. As many of you will know, the Pearson Center is a progressive think tank that was formed eight years ago. We address the major economic and social issues Canada faces, and the series addresses a number of the challenges that we face, especially this year and, 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 la and have done last year. Some 8,000 Canadians have joined us in webinars over the past 10 months. Today's session is primarily a briefing for senior diplomats on what to expect in this session of Parliament, but we are also uh, delighted to be joined by many Canadians interested in hearing from our esteemed panel who bring many years of hands-on political experience to our discussion. Uh, briefly on the format, I want to welcome uh, Rob Oliphant to the, to the Pearson podium again. He's Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and will speak to the government's international agenda. Then we will have a discussion with our panel for about 45 minutes. And then at 1.45, we will take questions from you, the audience. So please send in your questions on the question box uh, between now and then. And we will end promptly at 2.10 and after 2. Uh, we are honored today to be joined by two honorary co-chairs. At the end, we will hear from Her Excellency Romy Vasquez Morales, Ambassador of Panama. And to get us started, I will turn to our other co-chair, Her Excellency Saria Otmani, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Morocco. Madame Otmani, la parole est à vous. I think you have to unmute. Uh, Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, so much. Okay. So, good afternoon and uh, greetings to everyone. My name is Sonia Otmani. I'm the ambassador of the Kingdom of Morocco to Canada, and I'm enjoying my third so nice winter in Ottawa. Uh, it's a good opportunity for me as a diplomat accredited to Canada, and I'm also talking on behalf of my other uh, colleagues, diplomats, uh, listening to this webinar. Uh, I would, we would like to thank the Pearson Center uh, for progressive policy. We appreciate a lot all the numerous opportunities the Pearson Center gives us on the debates, panels, discussion, analysis, uh, which allow us to be more acquainted with uh, Canadian politics and also to hear and learn from guests with a prestigious background and profiles. Uh, we are pleased to hear their comments and insights uh, related to the news and to the latest de developments on the Canadian political scene. It uh, certainly helps all of us to better comprehend and understand the nuances and specificities of the uh, political environment of this great uh, country. Uh, I would like also, uh, if you allow me, to pay a tribute to our host and moderator, the Pearson, uh, the Pearson Center's president, Mr. Andrew Cardozo, uh, who spares no effort to keep us posted, uh, despite the frustrating restrictions challenging us in these unusual uh, times of pandemic. So, as a honorary co-chair for our today's webinar, it is my pleasure to introduce to our audience the panelists who will share with us their views and their suggestions about what should be the very substance of the current parliamentary uh, session. Uh, so, I have the pleasure to welcome the Honorable Robert Oliphant, uh, MP for Don Valley West, Ontario, and Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we have also visited the Honorable Rosa Galvez, Independent Senator from Quebec. Uh, we have the Mr. Robert Falcon Wellet, who is a former uh, Liberal MP who represented the riding of the Winnipeg Center for one term in the House of Commons. We have Mr. Yaroslav Baran, who is the former Strategic Communications Advisor for several conservative campaigns. He had the responsibility of former PM uh, Stephen Harper's leadership campaign. Uh, 
Mr. Jan Vaden is uh, with us of, uh, also. Who is, uh, Mr. Vaden is a famous politician, author, and filmmaker who served in the House of Commons representing the NDP. Mr. Jan Vaden served also as a minister and MLA in British Columbia. And last but not least, uh, we have the uh, pleasure to have Mrs. Mira Dukeran, a former Green uh, Party candidate. So uh, we are very lucky and thrilled to have all of you here with us, dear panelists. Uh, no doubt it's going to be an exceptional discussion. And now it's my pleasure to cordially invite Mr. Robert Olifan to make a few opening remarks. Thank you uh, very much, Your Excellency. Merci beaucoup, um, uh, Surya. It's good to see you again. And also, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Madam Vesquez Morales, good to see you again, and all my colleagues as well. And um, uh, my uh, senator colleague, as well as former and perhaps future members of parliament, um, uh, it is wonderful to be with you today. And thank you, Andrew, and the, your whole team at uh, the Pearson uh, Center for organizing today's event. I'm fascinated by it because I'm really interested to find out what you think is going to happen in Parliament uh, in this coming session. Um, I spend so much of my time with my eyes uh, focused on the world that uh, sometimes I forget what may be going on in, in the House of Commons or the Senate, and I'm going to be very interested to get your perspectives and insights um, on, on what you think is going on. Obviously, when it comes to foreign affairs, um, there are many issues that are gripping uh, Canada's attention, but none greater than COVID-19. The, the, the reality is that the pandemic is a major health crisis. It is a major economic crisis, and it teeters at times on being a major moral crisis. And I think as uh, parliamentarians and as uh, ambassadors and diplomats, our task today and in the future is to ensure that we address the health concerns with equality throughout our world and that we uh, deal with the economic fallout, supply chains, especially with lower and middle income countries, as well as lower and middle income people in our own country. And also we ensure that uh, no country takes advantage of this situation in negative ways, uh, in ensuring that this is not uh, uh, an enduring moral crisis that uh, uh, opportunistic leaders may take it as an opportunity to uh, infringe upon human rights or civil rights. So we are obviously in this. And what I think has happened is, as um, um, Leonard Cohen says in one of his songs, that it's, it's the crack that is letting the light in. And in this pandemic, the light that is shining is on some structural deficiencies in our own country and in our world but also on the need for multilateral activity, on the absolute interdependence of nation states and peoples around the world, that we cannot defeat COVID-19 in one place unless it's defeated in every place. And in one of those situations, it's unlike say a forest fire in California where we're able to send fighters, forest fire fighters, from Manitoba or Alberta or BC to help in a different area or to send them to Australia. It's not like sending humanitarian assistance in an earthquake area, a one-time situation. The whole world is gripped by this pandemic. Everyone is seized at trying to keep their people healthy and everyone is seized at the same time with trying to deal with the economic fallout. So we're in this together and Canada is finding a way to exercise leadership on the world stage, both diplomatically with respect to uh, my minister, Mark Garneau, but also with Karina Gold, the Minister for International Development, and Mary Ng, the Minister for International Trade Diversification. It is an approach that we are trying to make sure that no one in the world uh, is left behind. In the midst of that, obviously, we're acknowledging that there is a regime change in the United States, there is no relationship that affects Canada more than the relationship that we have with the United States. Like my mother would say, we love all our siblings, but the reality is Canada needs to spend special attention on the United States. It is just an economic, cultural and social reality. And I think every other country recognizes this as well, that that 
uh, the, uh, the the power that is exerted for good and or at times not for good by the United States is something that we need to be mindful of. And already in early conversations that Prime Minister Trudeau has had with uh, newly uh, inaugurated President Biden, as well as Vice President Kamala Harris um, and uh, Minister Garneau having his conversation with Secretary Blinken, we are already in this process of ensuring that 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 bilateral relationship is strong. It's always a bit bumpy. There are always going to be irritants. There's always going to be differences of opinion, but we're recognizing how important it is that we continue to work together. The other part that we are raising with the new administration is the essential role that United States of America can play in multilateral fora. We need them to be on that world stage with us, we need them to be part of us protecting the international rules-based order, and we need them to be part of the liberal democracies, which are ensuring that human rights are not uh, the, uh, restricted to only certain parts of our world. So we are already welcoming their reemergence as a, a signatory of the Paris Agreement. Uh, we are uh, recognizing that we share this continent and that environmental issues are absolutely crucial that we have to address energy requirements in a way that is um, appropriate for both countries to succeed and be prosperous, and we keep doing it. Also, always on in, 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 the, uh, in my rear view mirror, my side view mirror, and right in my front uh, windshield is our relationship with China. Uh, this has been extremely difficult. I think everybody knows that. Uh, we continue to deal with the arbitrary detention of Michael Spavor and uh, Michael Colvery, the uh, change in sentences of a number of Canadians who are facing um, uh, possible capital punishment in China. Uh, we have dealt with trade issues as well as uh, a variety of issues. And everywhere you turn, we have a relationship that is difficult and we need world partners. And uh, again, my appeal to all the ambassadors on the call today to, to keep joining with us in our holding of China to account with respect to its international obligations. And that may be with respect to a minority group such as the Uyghur or Falun Gong, or with respect to Tibet, or, and very recently, obviously, with respect to Hong Kong. This is something that uh, demands our, our, our constant uh, attention. Um, we continue, and this year we, we hope to see progress on accountability with respect to Flight PS752, which is one of the, uh, the signals of our fraught relationship with Iran and uh, our the, the need that we have had to work with other countries to find a way to deal with that horrific airplane downing, but also ongoing with respect to the best way to pull Iran into account and to make it a global citizen that is uh, uh, responsible and accountable uh, like the rest of us. There are many issues more. I mean, obviously, when I wake up in the morning, uh, Myanmar is on, uh, on my agenda. The Tigray situation in Ethiopia is on my agenda. Venezuela is on my agenda. Uh, Russia and uh, uh, democracy movements and protests are on my agenda. Uh, all of these things I am um, recognizing are setting the stage for a domestic uh, year ahead that uh, we want to keep engaging with uh, diplomats from around the world. So thank you uh, for being here today. And as I said, I'm really looking forward to finding out what else I'm supposed to be doing this year uh, from all my colleagues and uh, and would-be colleagues and uh, and getting your help on making sure Canada remains a, uh, a light in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, as usual, thank you for your, for your very insightful comments and, and, and a very quick overview of, of the issues facing Canada on the world stage. Um, if you're able to stay with us, wonderful. Um, and we'll come back to you with some of the Q&A. I'm sure some of the questions will, 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 will be for you as well. I will engage with our, with our panel for a bit now. And the question I'll ask uh, the, the people with, with connections to the four parties and I'll just mention that they're not representing the parties, but they're all, they all are active within those parties and will give you more of their personal thoughts. Um, so the first question for them is, what should your party be uh, addressing in the, in the session ahead in the next few months? And I'll start 
Uh, I'll go through the precedents as they do in the House of Commons and start with Robert Falcon Ouellette to uh, give us your thoughts about what the Liberal Party should be doing in this session of Parliament. Robert? That's Cree for, you know, welcome. Thank you, all my relations. Um, you know, I think there, for me, one of the greatest challenges that we're going to be facing right now is the clear divide in Canada between those who have money and those who do not have money. Um, I think this is going to be very, very difficult. It's uh, uh, especially into the future, uh, especially as we look at uh, governments and politics look to uh, deficit spending and what that means and who receives supports from the government. People who have jobs and who continue to have income are going to be cleaved off or taken, you know, that divide is going to be happening. And people who don't have income coming in, small business owners, uh, as we shut down uh, large parts of the economy, this is going to be extremely problematic. And, you know, unfortunately, like why there are a lot of uh, supports uh, that the government has put in place, I think this is still going to be a challenge because the amounts of supports often won't be covering the expenses and people are going to be burning through a lot of their savings that they've spent years building up. Uh, so this is going to present a huge challenge uh, to the future of the political uh, spectrum, you know, the Conservatives, the Liberals, and uh, the NDP and the Green Party. And it's going to represent challenges for some parties, and it's going to represent opportunities uh, for others. So I think one thing that the government needs to be thinking about is jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, you know, what do we do to get people uh, working? And so this leads me to my next uh, thought is, what the government needs to be thinking about is post-pandemic. There needs to be a large-scale study from Parliament about what the, our economy is going to look like post-pandemic. You know, and I know Rob Oliphant. You know, he talked a little bit about supply chains, um, but you know, how is this going to work? Where are people going to be working in the future? Uh, we know that the COVID has accelerated the change in our society. We're using Zoom more. Uh, there are going to be business owners that have office space that they're trying to rent, which are going to go bankrupt in the future because people who aren't going to be uh, wanting to rent office space like downtown Calgary. They're going to have workers at home. Even the federal government will be keeping workers at home because this is a significant cost savings if people uh, you know, don't need to come to the office. Um, so those are some of the things that I, I'm thinking about. I don't want to take up too much time because, uh, you know, it's always fun to have a bit of back and forth and not a monologue. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, I just it's it is, I think, going to be an extremely uh, challenging period for you know, the federal government in trying to satisfy uh, a lot of the demands uh, from people. Thank you, Ro Robert uh, Yaroslav. Your thoughts about the Conservative Party? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, I think both our Roberts have ably identified many of the important issues before government, you know, new U.S. administration, uh, continuing international and bilateral uh, aggression from China, uh, international justice, you know, democracy and human rights, the means and wage disparity, uh, greatly exacerbated by the pandemic, by the way, and so on. And I don't uh, disagree with any of these key themes that have been identified uh, so far. But if you'll forgive me, I'm going to pivot a little bit into a bit more of a, a pragmatic uh, assessment and answer to your question. You know, before I get into what Aaron O'Toole needs to do, I, we need to reframe the context here uh, or to mix up the metaphors. There's a big elephant in the room, uh, and that's this. We're probably going to have a federal election this year, period. And that being the case, everything else is going to flow from that central point. So. Um, you know, there are huge emerging themes. There's COVID response programs that address very real and acute needs of individuals, of citizens, of businesses. There's a new Canada-US relationship. Uh, there's a need for all parties to build credible and effective climate policy frameworks and so on. Uh, and there's a federal budget, of course, that's gonna be the main policy vehicle for, for all of these uh, important areas. Uh, but all of these things are going to be conducted through a pre-election prism. So what that means for the Conservatives uh, is that what, what Mr. O'Toole needs to do is more political than it is parliamentary. He needs to really focus on his name recognition. He needs to develop a comprehensive platform that's unassailable. Because let's, uh, let's acknowledge that traditionally in Canada, at least at the federal level, 
uh, opposition parties don't defeat governments, governments defeat themselves. And when that happens, voters cast about for who's the most ready uh, to pick up the torch. So that means having, having a, uh, a more centrist, having a comprehensive uh, uh, non-ideological platform. And I think he's already on the, on the track of doing that. He needs to bulletproof against the very predictable attacks that have already started to come his way because look, politics is politics. I'm talking about Oppo, and we've seen a lot of that in January already. And beyond that, I'll, and I'll just pause uh, momentarily, beyond that, there's really one topic and one topic alone that's going to matter, and that's vaccines, vaccine procurement. That's gonna be the single dominant issue for this year. And it's no wonder that it's the singular issue that all the opposition parties have been focusing on for the last several weeks, given that the government has been beset by a series of delays in shipping and opacity of contracts and uncertainty of supply of vaccines. This is gonna be the issue that determines the political fortunes of this year. And I think all opposition parties, frankly, should be focusing on that issue, just as the government is focusing on that issue, defense versus offense. And, and Yaroslav, uh, just briefly, are you counting on a spring or a fall election? Well, I think, uh, I, if, you know, if you'd asked me two weeks ago, I would have said that it really feels like a, like a late spring election, given, given the, the problems with vaccine procurement, uh, over the last fortnight or so, I'd say that there's a whole lot of uncertainty thrown up into the air over the last couple of weeks, that if I were in PMO planning you know, my ideal time, I'd be feeling a little bit skittish right now. So I think it's, it's, it's considerably more unstable uh, a question, or rather an answer, now than it was two or three weeks ago. Because what really is going to matter is a month from now, two months from now, three months from now, when Canadians see um, their counterparts in other countries, Germany, US, UK, et cetera, uh, lining up for vaccines, getting vaccines in their arms, and those statistics on how many people are vaccinated. You know, as we see that delta uh, grow between other, uh, other countries with which Canadians usually compare themselves versus Canada, then there's gonna be some anxiety developing. It's kind of like when you're sitting in traffic, Andrew, when you're sitting in traffic, everybody else is sitting in traffic, you just kind of like, okay, that's life. When another lane starts to move, you think, this is good, this is good. Traffic is lightening up. But 10, 15 minutes later, when the other lanes are moving and you're still sitting there, then you start to get angry. Yeah, it's a very powerful analogy. Um, Ian Waddell, I wanna ask your, your thoughts about what the NDP should be doing, but I just wanna tell our audience is one thing. Um, Ian is a, I was gonna say a lifelong, but for many years he's been a new Democrat, but he started his political involvement as a liberal and was a volunteer with Lester B. Pearson in his very young days. So it's a real pleasure to have you um, as an advisor to, the, to our center, Ian, and uh, good to have you here. So tell us your thoughts about the, about the NDP now. Uh, you've got a, you're on, you're on mute. Hey, can hear you. I can't. Yeah, I can't. we can hear you now. Oh, here you, you can hear me okay yeah. I, I said i'll be pearsonian <laughs> that's hard uh, uh rob uh, rob oliphant that was a really good summary pearsonian if you like and uh, emphasizing multilateralism which of course is what pearson was about uh, uh so i i appreciated that um uh robert um uh, you know um i liked your focus on what the post-pandemic economy is going to look like and if i might say it i co-authored an article on that very topic that's appearing in the uh, hill times on monday so please have a read of it will you okay and uh and uh yaroslav um on the federal election i agree with you and i thought and i hope you i'd like to see you run man new generation and uh, or be a backroom guy or another backroom person um but uh it was well put I think there'd be a provincial, a federal election if the li liberals get the, the the rollout of the vaccine under control. They want to have an election in the spring. They want to do what BC did and what other provinces did, get a big majority. Uh, if they don't get it under control, the opposition will pull an election in September, I think. But uh, let me talk a little bit about the NDP. Uh, the NDP is federally 
uh, different than the NDP provincially here in British Columbia. We tend in the provinces, which have all had social democratic governments at one time or another, we tend to uh, focus on winning elections. And the policy tends to be, you know, fairly just a bit left of center. Federally, it's a bit different. The base of the federal NDP believes in policy. They believe in what the NDP has achieved in minority governments through advocating progressive policies that were a bit ahead of their time. Example, Tommy Douglas in Medicare, brought in by Lester Pearson federally in the minority parliament. You know, uh, old age pensions, uh, Aboriginal rights, all sorts of things that the NDP were out there in front of. So, so uh, the NDP, I think, will be looking at federally at putting out for its men. They got to get the base, and the base is coming back because it's been a good parliament for the NDP. If you look at, um, I just wrote four things down. What happened in this parliament? They, they, the NDP through the through a minority government and using their their uh, leverage leverage, they doubled the cert to two thousand bucks. They got Canada Emergency Student Benefits. Thirdly, they got an income wage subsidy increased from 10% to 75%, and they got paid sick leave, the first uh, social program in a generation. I don't think they got the message out very well, Andrew, that they achieved this in the minority parliament, but they did, and and it's something for their to go to their base and to say to their base, well, this is this is this is what we've done. So what are we going to do for me now? And I think the two big issues are, and I, I think Robert and some of the Yaris Levin have referred to this, and, and Robert and the other Robert Oliphant did too. Uh, and that is the gap between the rich and the poor, okay? So, and so I see that and I see climate change as the two big issues uh, other than the vaccine and so on. But let's focus on, the, on those two. And I think on the climate change, or on the uh, gap between the rich and the poor, the NDP should come out and may come out for one solid policy, and that is uh, that is basically uh, a guaranteed uh, guaranteed annual income. Make it part. If they make that part, this is what we stand for. We're in a minority parliament. This is what we're going to push for. You know, and 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 the second thing is 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 climate change. The NDP is in. I, I see in an election campaign. Andrew, I see the Liberals and the Greens going really big on climate change, and uh, uh, I see uh, I see the NDP there trying to find their own way. But the NDP has a distinct position on climate change, and that that and I speak as a former Environment Minister of BC. Um, uh, we care about workers. We care about workers in the tar the, the tar sands or the oil sands. We're not going to let them behind. And look at the work that Rachel Notley did in Alberta. So I see an area there that the NDP could uh, could be distinct, even in climate change, and certainly could be distinct if they adopt uh, the policy on guaranteed income. And that appeals to their base. And they need that base because if they don't keep the base, the base will go liberal. And that will get the liberal majority government. And that, so that's what the pol the politics is about. Yeah, um, we can maybe discuss further things. That's that's wonderful. Thanks, thanks so much, Ian. Uh, Neer Duker, and tell us about your thoughts about what the um, and the uh, the Green Party should be doing. And you have a new leader in Anami Paul. Uh, share share with us your thoughts, please. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm um I'm just going to start by saying I'm not a politician, and I'm not working on the Hill, and haven't, and I'm not. I'm going to speak about the ins and outs of what's happening on the Hill. I'm stepping back a little bit. I'm in my home. I'm a retired teacher. I'm a mother of a child with special needs. I see around me all of the um, the devastation that's happening in people's lives, um, deaths and, and, and evictions and everything else. And I'm speaking stepping back. So uh, forgive me if I'm not going to refer to all kinds of political happenings on the Hill. Oh, that's fine. I'm, uh, I'm just going to say that in our view, in my view, and why I joined the Greens is because um, the breakthrough, the reset, the paradigm shift, the transformation, the just recovery, whatever you want to call it, it has to begin with a fundamental reordering of our priorities. And so all of the stuff we do around fix this and fix that and band this, and I know that we're in a very unprecedented this, that word time, and everybody's trying to figure out what's the best thing to do and get our bearings and orient ourselves. But I, I did something very simple in my submission. I, I you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I try and make things simple. Maybe it's too simple, but it makes sense to me and it makes sense to a lot of other people. 
I said, number one, look after the people. Number two, look after the planet. Number three, recreate an economy that serves number one and number two. And uh, I wrote a lot here, I'm gonna try and summarize. Number one, look after the people, could be called social justice broadly. Everything people need, health, uh, food, shelter, clothing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, number two, look after the planet, could be called ecological wisdom. Sustainability, protect the biodiversity, protect the planet that is our home. And number three, recreate the economy that serves one and two, could be called sustainability or nonviolence or both because we have an economy that is fundamentally violent. Violent to people, violent to the planet, violent from one country to another, from the, from the, the developed north and west to the, the global underdeveloped south. Um, so it's a fundamentally violent, violent um, setup, framework, structure that we have. It so happens that social justice, ecological wisdom and sustainability and sustainability and nonviolence are four of the six global green values shared by green parties around the, on the, across the planet. Just to, just to refresh your memory for, for some who aren't aware, this is the kind of thinking that really drew me to the Green Party after spending some time with the Liberals and the NDP. Um, the six global values, ecological wisdom, social justice, participatory democracy, nonviolence, sustainability, and respect for diversity. I think under those six values, if they, if they are our guiding light, our touchstone, our north star, our lighthouse in all of this, and everything gets measured against those values, we're going to be making better decisions. And I just want to throw in there as a side note that I really have so little interest in party politics and party bickering. And if the Titanic sinking and we're worrying about who's got, you know, market share here or winnability that I don't we need to be thinking about this very differently. Um, I'm going to Thank unpack you, just yeah. a little bit. Look after. The, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I, 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 can, can you wrap up? So I, just yep, I can wrap up. OK, I can wrap up. So look after the people, look after the planet and recreate an economy that that uh, that serves one and two. We have an opportunity now. Um, Greens are um, also we would guaranteed livable income, national pharmacare, a lot of policies that make sure that there's an income floor and a basic needs floor underneath all Canadians so that um, when this happens again, when structural change, uh, economic disaster, climatic disaster, environmental disaster happens, we've actually looked ahead and put in place proactively the systems and uh, primarily healthcare and guaranteed livable income that we're not scrambling to, to put band-aids on everything as we are now. We, we know these things are coming in the future. What we've seen in, uh, in, in the last year is that uh, our governments can make broad, sweeping, timely, fundamental systemic change when the political will is there. And we have, this is really just the beginning of, of future uh, structural readjustments that are gonna be needed. And um, we need to rebuild our, our economy in a way that serves uh, the health and the economic well-being of people. There's a lot more I could say, but I'll just stop there. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, Nira, for all for all the, the the issues you raised. But but the, the one thing I just want to highlight is is your point about political parties getting too um, tied up in the game of politics this year with a minority government. And and I think it's a real reminder that we really should be paying more attention to the policies uh, that that they have the ability to to implement. I, I want to uh, turn uh, to the turn our focus to the Senate. Uh, uh, Senator Rosa Galvez, I, um, I wonder if you could give us your thoughts about what the Senate will be doing. Uh, the Senate is becoming a much more independent body with, with the appointment of many new independent senators. Um, what do you think we will see in the Senate in the next few months, uh, Senator Galvez? Thank you very much for the invitation. And I know that we have a lot to say, so I will try to to pack my things. 
Um, I am in my fifth year as an independent senator. It's true that the Senate has changed. Now the independent group is now majority in the Senate, but we don't hold the uh, title of opposition. Um, so we are battling on um, uh, how to better express uh, uh, our independence approach. So we are embarked in a modernization of the Senate. But let's talk about what is happening in the last year. So we were firefighters. We were brought in the Senate to pass legislation concerning the COVID economic response. So in the whole um, 2020, we passed a dozens of um, emergency uh, bills, all concerning um, uh, money funds. So we know that uh, the government has spent, uh, I have it here exactly the right amount, is uh, uh, 200 billion in, in cash given away, plus 471 billion that has made available through credit. And uh, of course, this is a historical way in which the government are giving uh, money to uh, keep the economy afloat and uh, center the help on the workers. But there is also money that it's given as credit for the corporations to uh, keep employing and, and keep their, their uh, services going. Um, I was there in every single um, debate that was uh, where not many people could go because we were not prepared. So these uh, these pandemics has just exacerbated was was there already going on on inequalities and on inefficiency on the, the difference between the the very few rich at the top and the masses at the bottom. And um, and so for sure, for sure, there are concomitant crises that are going on. You know, we have, yes, the pandemics, but we have the economics, we have climate change, we have biodiversity loss, and we have this systemic racism, social, social crisis. Um, so the, the parliament vote, I think the House of Commons was um, faster in going into virtual settings for us to the Senate is taking us forever. And, uh, and I am very ashamed of this situation because uh, I know being in Parlamericas, which is a friendship of uh, 35 plus countries in the, in the Americas, we know that many countries um, more developed and less developed than us put measures in place to have virtual and automatic voting systems. So on that, we have to learn. Um, so some of the legislation that couldn't pass before the crisis are coming back. Like for example, the UNDRIP, so like uh, we take in consideration the um, United Nations right for indigenous people, so this is coming back. So we also have the other bill on uh, medical assistance to die, which we are right now studying that, uh, apart from all these economic bills that I, I mentioned. But we also have to do um, oversight committee. And I sit in, uh, I would say, uh, two important committees. I was until the last parliament, the chair of the Energy, Environment, and National, um, sorry, Energy, Environment, and Natural Resources Committee. Um, and now I am a member also of the uh, National Finances Committee where we were studying each one of these bills. So um, what I can say is that uh, for sure this COVID has exas uh, exacerbated things that were there and that we have to think on the recovery um, I, the, I, my office wrote a white paper, and I'm going to put it there for you to to read it eventually uh, when you have time. And in this white paper, we we answer to some existential questions like, uh, why are we in this concomitant crisis? What are the common roots? What are the what are the sources of the problems? Um, what is the the other parts in the world doing to uh, to come up with a different idea because yes, our economic system, uh, it's a little bit broken. You know, when you say at the same time, uh, the government came and uh, said in the Senate that we were having an extraordinary economy, but at the same time, we say that we are not that resilient and that we, have in a, we are in an economic crisis. So that's a little bit contradictory. So we need to fix things and, um, and of course, the big question is, okay, so we have had all these expenditures, 
where can we go to recuperate some of the money? And it's true, yes, there are um, a big initiative in the Senate for um, uh, guarantee livable income. I, I am part of these uh, 50 plus senators that are pushing for that, even though as a senators, we don't work on uh, money bills. Um, we are working with the other house on that. Um, but we are um, we are seeing that, for example, another thing that it was put in evidence during the crisis is that Canada doesn't have domestic capacity for uh, producing uh, medical uh, protection equipment or medical treatments or not even vaccines. So what happened with us? So we have to build again this resilience and to become um, independent. And for sure, on the climate crisis, uh, the whole thing has changed because we had for four years our neighbor, a very strong neighbor, denying climate change, and now he's out of the of the map. And we have uh, the Biden administration, which I had the opportunity to have a discussion um, two three weeks ago between Wilkinson Environment and um, uh, one of the uh, Democrats uh, ad advisors in climate, uh, Mr. Podesta. And, and we knew the day before of the uh, inauguration that Biden was going to come out with uh, uh, more than a dozen of executive orders. So that has changed a lot and uh, we have to take uh, care of this. And the economy is shifting to a low carbon economy and uh, Canada has to accelerate the pace to that. And uh, otherwise, we will lose in competitiveness for the Canadian industry. So on the side of the Senate, we are uh, trying to be the, the, the ones that see the long term. And, right. um, and yeah, so mostly that. Okay. And I will ready for asking, uh, um, answering question if there is any. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks. Very helpful. Um, uh, Ambassador Ahmani, you have a question for a panel, and I'll ask the panel to keep uh, your answers quite brief as we move along. So, um, Ambassador Ahmani. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Cardozo. I think I uh, really need to wake up for me to all the uh, comments and uh, insights given to us by our panelists. I think that we are aware that the uh, current minority in the North government and other political parties will be facing uh, sooner a new and inevitable election. We also understand that uh, this, in this very tough time of pandemic, domestic matters uh, will certainly and legitimately prevail and be addressed in priority uh, in the parliament. But, you know, as diplomats, we are always interested in foreign policy. We heard Mr. Oliphant, I mean, uh, telling us about the priorities of global affairs. But I'm very uh, interested if it is possible for the other panelists just to tell us if they really share the views of uh, Mr. Robert uh, Oliphant on uh, uh, the priorities of Canadian foreign policy. It will be great uh, to listen to them and uh, to, uh, to hear from them what, according to them, are the main and important issues the political parties should focus on uh, regarding the Canadian foreign policy uh, during the current session of the Parliament. And thank you. Okay, the, your sound uh, wasn't great, so I'll just repeat what I, what I, uh, the essence of your question. If you could just tell us, uh, the other parties, what, you, what, what would be your, what, what your party should be focusing on in terms of foreign policy? Uh, maybe I'll go with, uh, start with Ian Waddell first, and just briefly, please. You need to unmute, uh, Ian. So you need to unmute. Unmuted. I am unmuted yeah. now. We might want to start by asking what happened to, with great respect, Ambassador, the uh, Arab Spring. You know, when is in the Arab world going to see more democracy and less authoritarianism? But that's not maybe within Canada's power, but, but perhaps Canada can, can get tougher relations with Saudi Arabia, who has a murderous prince. I think we have to take a tougher line on human rights in, internationally. And, uh, and, and it's sparked by what China has done to us. But our major, as you know, the major concern of Canadian foreign policy is our relationship with the United States. And, and, and Rob Oliphant has already outlined that. So that's number one. That's our main concern. 
uh, the rest of the Middle East and so on. Well, you know, uh, uh, we did invent peacekeeping through Pearson. I hope we'll be active multilaterally, but uh, we've got some stuff to do at home first. Okay, uh, Yaroslav, your thoughts about international affairs? Sure. Um, I won't. Uh, I won't disagree with uh, with a lot of the themes that have been mentioned so far. Um, largely, I think the time is ripe, and the circumstances are emerging for uh, for sort of a retreat to core values. I mean, democracy, promoting democracy. Think China, Myanmar, Russia, uh, human rights. China, Hong Kong, Russia, Saudi Arabia, etc. And I think all parties really uh, are united on this, and we'll be hearing more about this. I agree that the that the central relationship that's going to be focused on uh, consciously and assertively is going to be the new Canada-U.S. relationship because it really is a fundamental reset happening right now. And let's not uh, deceive ourselves in thinking that it's going to be easy because. Uh, Mr. Biden and Mr. Trudeau, or frankly, all all leaders of our parties are you know cut from the same cloth, um, because it's it's not going to be an easy one. We've, we've seen Keystone, we're we're hearing Buy America, so it's there are going to be some challenges there too. And one one additional thing that I'm going to throw in there, a little bit more on the trade side of foreign policy, is uh, one of the big lessons in this pandemic is that the way we've done globalization and the way we've done trade liberalization in the past has left us with some vulnerabilities. We've, we've woken up to the idea or to the fact that we don't have PPE security, we don't have vaccine security, we don't have domestic production of necessary medicines. So I think that everybody going forward is going to start to think, what are the blind spots of the last 20, 30 years in, um, in our international uh, supply chains and in, in all the work we've done to liberalize trade and what needs to be fixed going forward for a more stable and secure uh, domestic situation. Thanks, uh, Yaro. And uh, Nira, your, your thoughts about the uh, foreign affairs? So you got to unmute. So. Yeah, I think, um, in fact, I agree with most of what Yaroslav is saying. And I think that. Um, our primary uh, focus on building uh, good relations with the new U.S. administration, and then becoming from from Canada-U.S. relations, creating a kind of um, strong position from which to address uh, whatever else whatever else is going on in the world. Right now, everything's gone to hell in a handbasket, really, frankly. So, working on the Canada-U.S. relationship first. Um, democracy and human rights, the upholding of the, whatever mechanisms we can use in concert with other um, progressive regimes to strengthen democracy and human rights. And under that specifically, I would say women's rights and minority rights. Thank you. But that's where we should be focusing. Thank, Thank you. you, Nita. Uh, Robert, your thoughts? Uh, well, I'm not disagreeing with anyone. I always come back to domestic politics. I believe it's the most important and the thing that we should always be considering. And when I think about the government, you know, we have to remember the history on July 5th, 1945, what happened to Winston Churchill. He won the Second World War. He still lost the election. And this government needs to be thinking, what does the future look like post-pandemic? What is the plan that we're going to present to Canadians if there is an election or not an election? And that is going to decide a lot of the foreign policy because it's going to be our primary focus about our future and our collective future together. Present a plan. Don't be uh, like Winston Churchill. <laughs> yeah, so be, like, be, like, be like Clement Attlee. There's a dictum that, that Canadians don't vote on international affairs. Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, I Generally, I believe so. Like, we all agree human rights are extremely important. We are a human rights country. We participate. I think we have great relations with the European Union. Uh, I think this protects us well. I think we've maintained those relationships uh, in spite of challenges with the United States over the past four years. Uh, we, we continue to be a, a good middle power. Uh, and have some influence around the world. And I don't see that changing, not, no matter who the government is. Thank you. Uh, Senator Galvez? Yeah, uh, I will agree with uh, Robert that um, um, Canada is seen in the world as a friendly country and a peaceful country and has very strong relationship with the, the Europe. 
but also with NATO, for example, recently there was this question on uh, the uh, proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons and uh, we stick to uh, our alliances very strongly. And uh, also we have, as I was mentioning, with Parliamerica, so that's all the countries in the, in the Americas and in the Caribbean, they see us as an example, as an, a model to follow. Um, of course, the, the, uh, the, the more difficult situation is with the Middle East and uh, um, but again, you know, I come from Quebec and Quebec have a, a fantastic relationship with the uh, Maghrebian, with North of Africa. Of course, there is competition with China. For example, I belong to a group with the World, Econo World Economic Forum and the International Monetary Fund. And, um, and we are listening more and more how China is uh, offering very strong um, financial assistance with very, very minimal um, string attached. And this is causing some uh, havoc in, uh, in African countries. So uh, I think we have to watch for that. Thank you. Uh, Rob Oliphant, would you like to add anything at this point in, in terms of the, the, advan the issues you think um, the government should be focusing on? Um, I think that um, we have, I'm hoping all parties become less reactive to these issues and more proactive. I mean, the reality is I think Canadians need to be led to care about development. They need to be led to care about humanitarian assistance. They need to be led to care about uh, COVID-19 vaccine distribution, income uh, redistribution, uh, development and trade issues. And I don't think Canadians will think about it by themselves. Uh, a few do. It's like the leaven in the lump. It is a, a small number of people. So my hope is that and I think Robert is right. I mean, it's not generally an election issue. However, I want it to be an issue. I want Canadians to recognize that our well-being is tied up in the well-being of the world. So um, I toss that back to the other parties to hope that it's um, not a football, but it, that it's a, uh, a, a, a partnership that we work on together. Andrew? Yes. Andrew, can I make a comment? Um, go ahead. Well, Rob, just to the rest of us, in 1998, I was Minister of Environment, British Columbia, or the year 2000, Minister of Environment. There was a COP conference on the environment. There's a COP26 happening in Glasgow, November 1st, uh, Rob, Rob Oliphant, uh, you probably know. And, and um, uh, back in uh, the year 2000, Lloyd Axler, the head of the Canadian delegation, and he asked provincial ministers to serve on it. Three of us did, Alberta, Quebec, and me from British Columbia. And we even brought the kids from the Sierra Club into the delegation. We had a hell of a delegation. So I would, I, I think you should look at, at getting a really good multi-party, multi, -party, multi uh, um, group delegation to that conference uh, November 1st in Glasgow on COP26, which is really going to uh, be important uh, for the uh, for the environment. It's just a suggestion, Rob, based on my experience. Thank you. Um, here, we have a question here from, from the audience. Uh, what is one, so this is for, for the panelists, uh, what is one policy that the panelists think all parties will agree on that we need to be addressing now. Um, maybe, uh, Robert, I'll start with you. Oh, uh, that's a tough one. I think uh, I think there's if something that I haven't mentioned, I think is going to be travel. I think, uh, you know, we're talking a little bit about international uh, relations, how travel actually works in the future with the new strains of COVID that are coming out of other jurisdictions like South Africa, Brazil, and the United Kingdom, and the effectiveness of our, our vaccines here in Canada. What does that exactly mean in the future? And, and I think while there's no ready answer for it, uh, it's going to have major impacts on supply chains. It's going to have impacts on immigration. It's going to have impacts on students. And there are going to be costs to the Canadian economy because we want to protect all the hard work that we have done collectively. And I think uh, the parties, while, you know, accusations could be made, like you're not doing enough or you're doing too much, um, you know, at the end of the day, we have to sit down, uh, you know, and at least think about these questions. And I, I ask that a parliamentary committees actually start doing the work 
uh, more, uh, you know, taking up this burden uh, to have the expert witnesses come in and testify. So this actual work is actually done so that there is actual substantive policy the government uh, might be able to implement. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I'll move this along a little more uh, rapid fire. Uh, Nira Dukran, your thought about one, one um, policy you think that all parties would agree to at this time? You're on mute. Sorry. I think given the, the health devastation, the devastation of COVID, a policy around health, the need to protect and expand healthcare services for all Canadians. Um, for example, I, I think it's abundantly clear to everyone that our long-term care homes should never be run on not-for-profit business models, um, suggesting bringing uh, long-term care under uh, and seniors care under um, the National Health Act is something that probably would receive um, you know, agreement by all parties at this stage so that we can monitor national standards of care including or in addition to that a national universal pharmacare program and the improvement of mental health services so what i would say is that what we can probably all agree on i hope at this stage is that extending and expanding what we all take such great pride in in canada our universal medicare program is something we probably we've all lost people regardless of our of our station or socioeconomic status like we've lost people we see people around us in our own lives and our own families um, suffering the health and mental health and physical health effects of what's going on. If we can't pull together on that, I don't know what, what we could agree on at this stage. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Yaroslav, a question for you. What is the best approach to deal with countries who are working to undermine democracy worldwide? Oh boy, where to begin? You, <laughs> say, you, say, you save the easy ones for the end, right? Uh, We're just uh, coming in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look, um, we're going to need a fundamental rethink of our role in the world. I think Canada's place in the world has traditionally been beset by sort of a, this overly simplistic and overly and unduly polarized uh, debate between sort of traditional allies and partners and you know Canada having a, a more robust presence and muscular presence versus multilateralism and working through the UN, et cetera. Like neither of those options is going to be correct and successful in the extreme. It's gonna be somewhere in the middle and we're gonna to have to do a rethink about where it is that we play, how it is that we play, who are the friends with whom we surround ourselves and how do we best leverage the strongest Canadian assets that we have to make a difference. You know, blind and unthinking unilateralism, or sorry, multilateralism for its own sake actually uh, doesn't allow us to, uh, to to punch uh, to punch above our uh, above our weight, unilateralism certainly isn't an option for a medium power. So I think all parties are going to be looking at you know how are we going to how are we going to do this going forward? Who are who are the real friends and allies in our pursuit for democracy, human rights, um, and fundamental freedoms? Thank you, uh, Senator Galvez. You work on the international uh, scene quite a bit. What are your thoughts about how we uh, how we uh, what our approach should be to countries who undermine democracy well listen you know all what we have seen uh, in the last 40 years should uh, be a wake-up call and that we know the inequalities and extremisms were in the rise and we have to worry because uh, the common citizen is losing um, uh, trust in the democratic institutions and i think that's the last thing we want to to lose uh, therefore, we have to be um, uh, mindful, and, and there is a, 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 a initiative that I'm working on, on open parliaments, open parliaments, open governments, so to increase the transparency, to uh, avoid situations where corruption is there, uh, to um, uh, tell the public how do we take the decisions in the government, and I think that we need to, to do that. It's, it's, it's critical at this point. Okay, thank you all. Uh, th thank you for your answers. I will turn over to our co-chair, uh, Ambassador Romy Vasquez-Morales. Uh, you may have a question and, and some words of thanks, so please go ahead. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cardoso. I, I wanted to ask you a tricky question, and you all have uh, said how important is the relationship between Canada and the USA. But what about if the, the scenario was not Biden and then Trump? You know, it, and I think that you all have a very strong uh, a comments 
on what is the priority for Canada and the U.S. relationships. But what about if it would have not been Biden? Who, who wants to start with that? Um, I, I want to start. Jaroslav is laughing. I guess I guess he has yeah. a strong opinion on it. Oh Can I boy. Start? Go ahead. Can I start? Senator. Yeah. Okay, so we 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 were already thinking about that a lot in Parliamericas, and uh, we know that Canada uh, has a whole world after the United States there waiting for us to uh, strengthen relationships, and so uh, we were we are um, looking at uh, Mexico and south of Mexico for uh, establishing new trades, um, new exchanges, and uh, we were talking about foreign workers, about refugees, about um, Canada's mine, mining industry has a lot of uh, uh, work over there and it's installed in the, in, in the Americas. And we were looking into a new, new ways, new, new sectors and the, um, and ones that were, were there for, for example, biodiversity. Of course, tourism right now has taken a um, hit and we will have to rebuild tourism. But there were uh, discussions on new ways, uh, new ways of in tourism. Okay, so we uh, 30 seconds on that or anything else, everybody else. Uh, Ian Waddell, you're next, 30 seconds. Well, the question, what would we do if um, uh, difficulties between a crazy United States and the rest of the civilized world, right? <clears throat> so I got a book from my uh, bookshelf here a minute ago. <clears throat> you see this one? Yeah. So what did he do? Well, at the Suez crisis, as I recall, he, uh, uh, the Americans were uh, split from the Brits, the French, and the, and the Israelis. They weren't their allies. And he put it. Pearson got them together, and I think that's maybe Canada's role, uh, but a lot stronger, you know, to get up and speak and be active. And I like what Bobby Ray, my old colleague, is doing in the United Nations. So uh, Rob Oliphant and the people in external, get Canada out there and get them talking and get them try to bring our allies together. Uh, I think that's our role, and there's our model. Okay, thank you. 30 seconds, Yaroslav. <laughs> sure, you know, and uh, sure you can do it. Yeah, like um, I, I always, I always caution my media training clients never to answer hypothetical questions. But this one's just too irresistible. You know, uh, the COVID infection rate would have been worse in the states. That means a probably a later border reopening uh, between Canada and the U.S., a late, a later resumption of a normal economy between Canada and the U.S. Protection, uh, protectionism would have been greater. Uh, south of the border, not just steel and aluminum, but also vaccines. Yeah, we are seeing some of this right now in, in the States, but under Trump, it would have been more pronounced, it would have been more rude, and vaccine supply probably would have been used as a cudgel and blunt tool of foreign policy. So I, we certainly have a better outcome based on what happened in the US election, and, uh, and it would have been far less smooth going forward otherwise. Thanks, Anira, 30 seconds. You're muted. That doesn't count as your. I'm I'm not a foreign policy. Yeah, I'm not a foreign policy expert. I would say that uh, had had Trump been reelected, we continue to, as I'm sure that we are, seek common ground with like-minded allies, like-minded regimes around the world, and try and strengthen those relations so that we can work in common purpose with regimes that are upholding the same kinds of democratic human rights and social justice um, and, and, and environmental um, progressive policies that we are. Work with like-minded people. Build those Thanks. Solutions. Robert, 30 seconds. Once again, I, I'm just going to say jobs, jobs, jobs. What does the post-pandemic economy are look you like? Wrong, you know, you uh, no, but I just think this is important. If any government, if you want to be a government, you have to think about people, and people need jobs in order to support their families. You need tra You know, how do we work our travel arrangements? We need to be thinking about our kids and their mental health in the future, uh, setting them up for success, like with their schooling compared to other countries which have continued to do schooling. And we've had a lot of disruptions. And I think Parliament, it's time for them to really start sitting again. Now, not this uh, distance uh, type of sitting, but get them, the parliamentarians vaccinated, get them down, speaking to each other, working uh, through their committees, get the staff, because it is an essential service. Our government, 
our institution is an essential service. It needs to be functioning every day uh, to asking the tough questions and also finding some solutions and recommendations for the future. Hey, thank you. Uh, Rob, Rob Oliphant. Well, I'm, I, I would probably take Yaroslav's advice and um, uh, not, you know, the hypothetical is always dangerous. What I would say is um, you look at the last four years and we did all right. It was, it was difficult, um, but uh, a pretty feisty now Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister stood up and uh, we didn't do badly on, on the re, uh, renewal of, of NAFTA. Um, we've held our own, but then I'd, I'd secondly say that actually Nira is a foreign policy expert because mm -hmm. I would say that that's the best advice, that we, we seek like-minded where we can get them. We recognize that we are a smaller country, a middle power, and we don't do things alone well, and, uh, and, and we would keep doing it. Lastly, I'd say to Robert, we're working. Um, uh, we're working um, every day, day and night, uh, yesterday, committee, um, uh, into the into the late hours, and parliamentarians are finding a way to work virtually. And is it is it good? No. Uh, is it better to meet each other face to face? Yes. But I also recognize that uh, vaccination is not the solution for us because we would still carry back that virus and could reinfect other people. So uh, we're in this with all Canadians. We'll we'll take our turn on vaccination. And uh, meanwhile, I don't stop working. Uh, before I give the last word to uh, Ambassador Vasquez Morales, I just want to quickly tell the audience about uh, we've got four webinars coming up on February the 11th at 12 noon. We'll be talking about seniors care policy on February the 16th. We're talking about energy affordability on February the 18th. We're talking with um, uh, uh, status of women or, or I guess it's gender equality minister, uh, Miriam Monsef. Uh, on a number of issues in her portfolio. And on February 19th, we'll be talking about child care. Uh, some of these are pre-budget type of discussions, especially around um, seniors policy and child care. So with that, uh, please join us then and over to you, uh, Ambassador Vasquez Morales for the final word. Thank you very much. Oh, well, on my final comment, I definitely want to thank the Pearson Center for Progressive Policy and Mr. Cardoso for this kind invitation to participate as co-chair at this webinar that was addressed to the diplomatic community on this new session on parliament. And it has also been a privilege, obviously, to co-chair this virtual floor with my colleague, the ambassador of the Kingdom of Morocco, Suriya Otmani. And to join this friendly uh, discussion with uh, important actors on the Canadian political arena, especially the Honorable Olifan, who I, I, I consider my friend, but I also agree with so many of the things that he has said, and the Honorable Rosa Galvez, who we have always met on Parlamericas and uh, being both from the same hemisphere, me from Panama and, and Honorable Galvez from Peru, we share so many thoughts. Year 2021 has arrived and we are still struggling with this event and no country was prepared for. Our governments have tried to do their best in a critical situation. And we cannot but accept that after so many months, we have advanced in so many ways to come together, to find solutions, to start new venues for cooperation, and to move forward both domestically and internationally. So my message is that after listening to all of you, and considering that in the audience there are so many people from the from the uh, diplomatic community, we are wondering if you ever look at us. We are your relationships. We are your trade partners. And I don't I don't uh, disregard the fact that the U.S. is your most important relationship bilaterally, because for Panama the U.S. is the most important relation bilaterally. And I do agree and recognize that Canada, as a, it's a smaller country in population than the United States, but it's a still a very big country for us. And we are part of the hemisphere. So my message, very, very simple, is that 
I will need to agree with Honorable Oliphant on the fact that we need to be less reactive and more proactive. And just like Honorable Galvez said, because of the last four years, we were looking at the other markets. We were finding ways to work on cooperation, different kind of cooperation. And today, COVID is forcing us to work on cooperation. So I thank you very much. And I, I am very grateful that you decided to answer my question because honestly, you, you, you still look at other countries. You still look for new trade partners. And we're all partners and we have to come together. And yes, indeed, we are also partners being vulnerable and trying to build the capacity to resolve so many options. And, and, and for example, have vaccines manufactured here in Canada that were in the past. So as Jaroslav commented on the fact of globalization, yes, we could all participate in globalization, but we also have to keep some domestically and that Mr. Falcon will give us jobs, jobs and jobs. So thank you very much uh, on behalf of all my colleagues. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.